Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, our first ever live webinar from Ref6. My name is Hassan Rajwani, and I'm with John Wilkes from obviously Ref6 as well. Um, today, we've got a, a really exciting guest. We're going to be talking about everything to do with how to prepare for your next match. Um, before we get started, we're going to wait uh, a few minutes just to allow people to come. Uh, stop what they're doing and get over to the stream so they can watch uh, what's going on. But first, what I wanted to do was just give you a little bit of a brief background about Ref6 um, and who we are, and then we'll get into introducing and welcoming our guest, FIFA referee, Matthew Conger. Um, so just to give you uh, a bit of a background, if you don't know, uh, Ref6 is our app that we've developed. We are referees in England, um, and it is designed to help you keep track of your career. So you can add upcoming matches that you're about to officiate. You can go in on your phone and record the result, what just happened, what the score was, how many cards you gave, um, and, and keep a track of all the matches you've ever done. Um, and if you have a smartwatch, so an Apple watch, an Android watch, a Samsung watch or a Garmin watch, you can actually use the Ref6 app on your watch during a game with uh, to help you with a lot of things. So that will be helping to track your timing, um, help uh, recording incidents in a game like goals, cards, and substitutions. And in the background, we're also tracking your physical performance. So after the game, you'll be able to review how far you ran in the game, your positioning on the pitch, um, how many sprints you've done in the game. It is truly a one-stop shop for everything you need to do to manage your games um, as a referee. So uh, if you haven't already, make sure to go to the App Store or the Play Store to download the app. Um, you will not be disappointed. So enough of that. We are now, and you are here, to uh, not listen to me, but to listen to our guest. So I am now going to uh, bring Matthew Conger, our uh, esteemed guest, to the stream. Matthew, how are you? Hi, Hassan. Hi, John. Great to see you guys. And great Thanks to see all that. those people that are out there in the netherverse. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for uh, for joining us today. Um, how are you, first and foremost? I'm I'm very good, thank you. It's uh, it's been a little bit of a uh, the last few days have been very busy in terms of travel and matches and whatnot. But uh, yeah, it's it's part of the game and part of the part of what I'm used to now as a as a professional referee. So it's. It's, uh, it's good. Awesome. Um, before uh, we get delve into the top the topic of today, I just wanted to share kind of some of Matthew's achievements and a little bit of a biography. Uh, so Matthew Conger was born in the USA. Um, he started his refereeing career there as a teenager before moving to New Zealand. Um, in New Zealand, Matthew rose through the ranks uh, and culminating in refereeing New Zealand Football Championship, um, where he was refereeing there for six years, and then he got nominated for a FIFA badge by his confederation. Uh, since becoming a FIFA referee, and this is a long list, it's awesome, uh, Matthew has refereed at the 2015 Under-20 World Cup in New Zealand, 2017 Under-20 World Cup in South Korea, the 2015, 2017, and 2018 Club World Cups, uh, refereed at both Rio and Tokyo Olympic Games, the 2020 FIFA Arab Cup, the 2018 FIFA World Cup. So those were all of those international big appointments. But alongside officiating in the uh, elite level in New Zealand, uh, Matthew has also refereed on the Australian A-League, the Saudi Premier League, the Indian Super League, the Chinese Super League, and most recently, the MLS. Um, and this winter, he will be in Qatar for the World Cup. So, did I miss anything there? <laughs> no, I think that just about covered it. <laughs> awesome. So, um, today, the purpose of the conversation is to talk about match preparation, right? So, what does match preparation mean? All of the what entails for that. So, that's everything from researching the teams, um, that you'll be refereeing in your game to communicating with your officials that you might be going out with, how to prepare your body, your mind, what you do on match day, um, 
and just to basically make sure you're in that best physical and mental state before you blow that whistle. So, Matthew, I'm going to kind of move it over to you, but I think you wanted to share a little bit more about your philosophy first, and then we delve into it. Is that what we'll do? We'll just... Absolutely. So, you know, in terms of thinking about the the match day, of course, we can we can sometimes get hung up on, as you said, those things of, you know, who's playing, where am I going, all those sort of thing. And we forget, actually, that refereeing is a very human endeavor. We're, we're refereeing a game played by humans, and therefore we're bringing ourselves, you know, into that match day. So um, what I wanted to share is, uh, you know, along the way, of course, the, the, the details of what that looks like day to day and, and um, you know, what that might be in terms of some of the specifics, but as I've, as I've developed as a referee, the, as, a, as you kind of put it, the philosophy around refereeing around what I'm bringing to each match has become really important to me. And I guess to, for ease to, to, to um, refer back to throughout the way we can sum that up into sort of three things, which for me are uh, vision persistence and resilience. So a referee needs to have all those three components throughout a match leading into it, during it and after it, uh, I think to make a, a really um, successful and long refereeing career because of course, refereeing is a marathon event. It's not a sprint event. Uh, we have to, I'm aware, hopefully my Wi-Fi is hanging in there. I'm in Houston, Texas, and we're in the middle of a, a thunderstorm is passing. So I don't know how, you have to let me know if you, some of that broke up. A little but, bit, um, but you okay. can do now. Okay, perfect. So um, in, in terms of some of the specifics around that vision, persistence, and resilience, uh, as, as hopefully you can see on the screen, that idea around vision being where I want to go, okay, and who I want to be as I'm as I'm going along that journey, right? So for me, it's become very much about process versus outcomes. Uh, obviously, we want good outcomes, but the and and again, thinking about that match day, it's the processes that we adhere to and that we've have in, embedded in place that lead us to those most successful outcomes uh, for the match. Um, persistence I define as doing the little things with excellence repeatedly. And sometimes those are the things that we can overlook, but having that persistence to, to really focus on what are those habits? What are the traits? What are, again, who, uh, what am I bringing, you know, to each match that's going to make that little bit of a difference. Mm -hmm. um, as you progress, you know, um, it's, it's fine margins, you know, in the game of, in the, in the, at the elite level of the game, it's very fine percentages that get us between a win, uh, a draw or a loss. And so it's the small details focusing on excellence that really, that really matter. And then of course we have to have resilience. So that's that ability to bounce back. So it's not just one thing. And that can be both on the pleasant side of things. I mean, we, we often frame resilience as something unpleasant happens and I have to be able to bounce back from that again mm -hmm. uh, before, during and after a match. But um, uh, resilience is also in the pleasant thing. So we have to know how can I bounce back from repeated success because that can sometimes create its own little hurdles. So um, I, if you can see it, it's, I, I love this quote by um, Adam Grant, um, who's a social psychologist here in the, the U.S., written a couple of fantastic books. But he states that, uh, and I'll try to paraphrase that basically, you know, resilience is not a, an in sum. It's not always the same for everybody that actually, um, you know, it, depending on the situation, depending on the person, it may take longer. It may take less time, but it's that that strength to carry on, you know, and that we have to we need to be aware of. So understanding that resilience and we'll tie in with culture and values here as we as we move forward but focusing at the moment on that vision persistence and resilience are, are really important to my match day preparation awesome and uh just out of interest like is this something that you've 
you've recently done or is this something that you've put together those kind of three arms or pillars of your philosophy is it something recent or something you did when you first started refereeing it's, it's this has probably been the, the the work over time from about uh 2016 especially onward mm -hmm. um when i became really um aware of these intrinsic or what some people term the the soft skills they're the character skills actually that that enable us to really move forward or sustain where we are currently so mm -hmm. um it's it's it, it's been since 2016 but then i'm but i'm always kind of i'm try to stay in a very much a growth mindset a learning mindset so i i, I try to apply these um uh, and, and learn and add to them as i need awesome so they've adapted over time brilliant no, thank you for sharing that. And I'm sure we're going to touch back to that as we go through Absolutely. through these through these questions. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's an unbelievable insight already as well. And something that, you know, I can take into my game as well. So I'm learning stuff already. Um, but obviously, if we could go through like your week leading up to mm -hmm. sort of a match day, really. So game on the Saturday, nothing else through the week, no midweek games or nothing. So like, what, when do you start thinking about the game and, you know, what do you do leading up to that Saturday game, really? So, it, again, it does depend a little on the level, but if we're thinking about, you know, if I kind of put myself back, uh, you know, a few years, uh, you know, of course, the and it is, we, we've talked about, you know, it is a little bit cultural in terms of what is expected from the league and from the organization, you know, or, or um, the, again, the, the culture, the refereeing culture, the the football culture in um, in the UK is slightly different from the soccer culture and, and refereeing culture in the US. Uh, it's it's different again in New Zealand because again because it's simply smaller. Mm -hmm. um, it's 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 different all around the world. So it's but there are some some similarities, of course. So you know, of course, once the once the match is confirmed, it's making sure to to um, reply to that appointment uh as, as quickly as possible depending on you know it used to be via email it used to come or maybe it comes out in the spreadsheet so making sure yep double checking yep i'm if it's in the spreadsheet yep i'm on this field okay right i know where i'm going so that's that's step number one really is you know do i know the details of the match where am i going who am i refereeing with um and then it comes down to, okay, what are the teams, what's the level of the competition? So I will, um, uh, in the past, I probably maybe spent a little bit more time on that, really kind of researching um, if I could find, uh, I, I might. So again, when I, as I was, as I was coming up, um, the, the use of regular video um, capture for for matches was not as prevalent as it is now so now you can probably find most matches of a decent standard you know a lot of them are streaming them on youtube or you could find them you know at least some sort of clips uh but we used to talk to uh, fellow officials who might have refereed the team the week before so we get some insight into into the tactics of the team the way they play but again you know I think most, if you, as you're developing, you know, we're, as we start to pay attention as referees, we understand the leagues that we're working in, that, that most teams tend to play in a, in a certain way, right? They tend to play in a certain style. So especially in the early part, doing that research, you know, to find out exactly how the teams are going to play um, is, is really crucial or in leagues where, like I know a couple of the leagues here in the U.S., you have they're they're um, quite ethnically different. So you have teams that are, um, you know, there's a there's a Nigerian team, there is a Mexican team, there is a Honduran team, and those will be different. And that, so understanding the temperament and the styles of play are really important. So get getting some of that 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 research done is 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 understandable um understand uh, for for again for for myself i also one of my one of my i suppose um i wish i spoke 
Spanish more fluently than I do. I, I learned mm -hmm. enough Spanish to get by uh, on the on the football field. In fact, I get a bit of a hard time at times uh, it, it, because in the Pacific, they speak French. Uh -huh. And I've been known to talk to a player in Spanish, in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> needing, but most of the time it works. But uh, so again, that's part of that pre-match research. You know, do do the teams speak English or, or do they speak the language that I can communicate in, you know, uh, um, uh, person to person? A lot of that is is up here, you know, mm -hmm. facial expressions and nonverbals. But, you know, can we communicate? So and if we can't communicate, it's my responsibility to learn enough to be able to communicate with them um, or find a way to do so. Uh, I do look at, and even now I do look at where the teams are ranked in terms of, you know, where they are on the table. Sometimes that gives us a, a, an insight and sometimes it doesn't. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I am, a, I, I do believe that even though teams will spend, you know, and the higher the team is in terms of professionality, you know, they'll spend a lot of time with their systems and they'll play and, and, and you can, and I'll talk a bit about that in a moment, but you know, the, the, the game is dynamic and things will change. And if you're not prepared to have that flexibility and that dynamism in your approach, then, you know, you can come unstuck. Uh, so understanding where they sit in the, in the table, uh, um, understanding where they are again, even as simple as what's the weather, mm -hmm. Looks like that storm is uh, is brewing in uh, Houston. Hopefully, we'll have Matty back in in a second. Um, while we're waiting, meant to be uh, how that. Meant oh, here we go. He's back. Sorry, I we lost just, you for a second. The, the lightning is the lightning is overhead, so I could I saw a flash, so I thought, well, oh, <laughs> it's, it's only a moment before the Wi-Fi gets interrupted. So, understanding the weather. You know, um, <laughs> what could happen and being prepared for for that. Again, this comes back to that whole vision, persistence, resilience. How am I going to handle myself if there is an interruption? So mm -hmm. in my um, uh, second MLS match, we were in Charlotte. We had a three hour weather delay and then we had to step onto the match. You know, uh, we played for 16 minutes before, again, more weather issues. So we had to know how we were going to going to do that. So um, understanding that. Um, and just, I guess, to, to close this off and to give some insight. Uh, at FIFA tournaments now, we have two technical coaches that are embedded within the referee program. And so we get, uh, and that happens at, at uh, certainly they work throughout the UEFA competitions. I know it happens across different confederations to increasingly at different, uh, but at different levels. So they are looking at and, and, and giving some insight into how to break down a team. So looking at, you know, what is, especially what do set pieces look like? What do, um, what do uh, key players, how, how might they perform? You know, do they tend to play down the flank and then move it in? Are they more of a, you know, if this player is on, it's a one-on-one -on -one situation. Uh, so we will, we will go through, you know, at, 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 the World Cup and, and other FIFA tournaments or other major events like that, we will go through a very much a technical debriefing of the teams, but we also prepare for the, that match by training, integrated training with players in the weeks building up to it or the week building up to the, to the match. And they, they prepare the teams to play in that certain style. Okay, so I, recently we were just at the FIFA uh, at the FIFA Arab Cup in um, in Doha last November, and one um, one uh, hallmark of that competition was some of the unpredictability of play. So they actually got the players to create as many unpredictable situations as possible, so that we were prepared for it. So that's something else. I mean, I could um, I'm a real advocate for as we develop referees, we need to do a better job of uh, in using integrated training to increase that decision-making throughout the week so that when they get to, to a Saturday, Sunday, you know, get to that match, that they have made all those decisions and they're really prepared 
to step into that match in a, in a better way. So uh, that's a little bit of that insight into to how we would prepare. Are there any any questions you want to go with from there? Or um... Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, I'd be intrigued to understand, like, how do you make sure that the research that you do doesn't bias you when you go into that game, right? I think it's great, great to have as much understanding as possible. I guess that adds experiences so you can call on that during the game. But how do you make sure it doesn't bias you? Especially yeah. if you're going in thinking, I've got top versus bottom, you know, maybe already psychologically you're thinking, actually, it's going to be an easy game today because it's going to be, I'm only going to be standing in one half. Yeah. And then after 10 minutes, the, the, the bottom team score, you know, how do you make sure you're not influenced by that research? Absolutely. I, I, I think understanding bias and our own biases, again, that's part of that. We're humans in a human game. So we, 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 we cannot separate ourselves from that. Um, and so un- the more that we have that self-awareness of what we're bringing in, the better that we're able to, to deal with that. So understanding bias, I think, is a really important part. One thing that, that, that stands out, uh, a guy named Alfred Klonitis, who was a legend of, of referee education here in the U.S., once said to me, um, you know, the difference between a great referee and a, you know, everyday good referee is that the great referee is never surprised by what happens on the field, which means that they've had that experience and they are not, they're not surprised. So part of that is, is keeping that bank of experience. Oh, I've been here before. I know what to expect, or I know how to react. I know how I might react as well. Mm -hmm. Um, it is really important. Uh, and I guess to say as well that, that to provide an anecdote to say we just have to be aware of the bias and not bringing in any bias. So uh, I was recently at a match, uh, very recent, where uh, in the in the, we you know we talked with the assistant, you know we talked with my team, like okay, any players we need to be aware of, I need to just watch this player. He, you know, he, he talks a lot to referees, and and often he he often gets carded. Sometimes he, you know, a lot of referees kind of walk off saying, oh, I wish I'd cautioned him for dissent sooner he actually kind of plays a little bit better with that i said okay and i was probably being a little bit cheeky in the dressing room and going oh you know i can kind of preempt it go yeah you know give him a wink and go hey i you know i know who you are type of thing and um and i learned a very valuable lesson uh that we can't carry that in because that actually i did try that and and it didn't work at all in fact (laughs) it it created this antagonistic kind of relationship between us and at one point in the match, he said something to me and um, uh, kind, of, he, uh, kind of questioning my character. And I said, don't, you, don't question my, you can't, don't question, you don't know me, don't question my character. And he said, it's the same thing you did to me. And I thought, we were, for, it was a goal kick, the game was a little bit stopped and, I, and I, I'm like, shoot. And I just said, you know what, you're right, I apologize. And it totally changed the demeanor of that interaction with that player. And for the rest of the match, and he ended up losing, they lost the game. But in the rest of the match, no problems. He came, he shook my hand. It was like, it was cordial between us. And it was a really valuable lesson for me around being aware of what I'm bringing in and, you know, um, that it's okay at times as well to recognize, hey, sometimes we get it wrong and we have to apologize. So understanding that, again, what am I bringing in and how can I apply that in the match to, for that? What are the processes I need to make sure that we get a successful outcome? So even though we had sort of 70 minutes of tension, we got 20 minutes that, that weren't, and we finished really well. So that to me is uh, an understanding of, of that. So some valuable lessons to be for, for myself that I'll continue to apply moving forward. Oh, awesome. I think you've kind of just answered perfectly about you got to be very, aware of those biases going in mm. you mentioned earlier around communication to back to the t- uh, the teams um what about to your your team your officials in the week is it simply a case of hey i'll meet you here at this time or do you give do you give any more insight uh, or information to the officials during the week mm-hmm. and maybe maybe if you do or you don't but what are some other things that other officials have done during mm-hmm. the week that, that you felt were quite interesting or, or useful. Sure. So again, this is developed over time. 
I used to, to send out, you know, a page. I, I try to get it down to a page um, of, of bullet points in terms of my pre-match preparation so that we didn't necessarily have to go through all the details, the spiel, you know, together. Um, mm -hmm. Or, again, this is if there's some trial and error that's going to work with it. What works with, you know, your personality? What works with the people that you're working with? And so... You know, we used to go through boom, boom, boom. You know, um, I'm, I'm trying to even to think of, I could go through my own, I still go through a pre-match now if I need to work, you know, if we need to tonight. So we, we've got a, a ML, MLS match tonight. Um, I know one of the assistant referees, I've not worked with her though. I've not worked with the, the other um, folks on the crew. So we'll go through a little bit more, you know, detail in terms of what we want. Mm -hmm. But again, if you flick back to that first slide, um, the biggest thing in terms of communication now I, I confirm logistics, you know, when are we showing up, where are we going to do? I like to have a coffee, you know, an hour before we go to the ground um, as a way to, I, I just like it personally, but also it's a good way to, to chat. And for me, this is where we talk about that, that values and culture and culture and values. So I, I really want the people that I'm working with to feel empowered to be the best that they can be, right? So this has become something that, again, I've become very intentional about. And so when I communicate, I want to make sure that I'm communicating not just the not just the facts or you know this is this is what we're going to do, the job at hand, but actually, hey, you know, I really want you to feel a part of the team. And um, Things that we can do to, to to start that off. So again, that's that's starting to build some of that relationship, um, and so uh, in terms of conversations with the team, I'll ask if there are any questions. Um, just like so there is, like I'm literally there's quite a good thunderstorm happening outside. So if if, if we get interrupted, please. Uh, uh, no, you're good. Just to let you know, um, <laughs> you know, we don't have in the uh, certainly in. Um, uh, in the U S we don't necessarily have a lot of direct uh, com uh, conversations with clubs. Whereas I, I'm my understanding in the UK, you've got a little bit more interaction with the clubs. Um, we have obviously the color confirmations in terms of making sure that, you know, everybody's wearing the right kit. Um, you know, knowing what our contingencies will be if that, so again, there's communication around that with the team, making sure to check, uh, check that information, the match date information. Um, you know, if there's travel or whatnot, we make sure to con confirm those logistics. Um, I know that some people, again, probably earlier in their career, may spend more time developing that pre-match conversation. Um, I know of one guy that I think it's about five pages. And that, you know, it seems like a lot, but that for him, he's really, again, detail focused and he wants to make sure he covers everything. So, um, it, it depends a little bit for each person yep. there, but, but it's definitely mine has probably to a degree de decreased, but also really honing in on, you know, what are the values that I want to bring across? How do I want my people, that team to feel like a team? And I might have two hours, you know, to, 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 to enable them to, to, to kind of join into that team culture that I, that I really want to espouse. Um, we've got two hours to make that happen so mm -hmm. that when we get to the 90 minutes, you know, we've got, we've got that in place so that people can, can feel empowered to be excellent. And I think, uh, at least from my learnings, especially in the pre-match kind of com conversation, of course, when you've not been out with the officials before, you'll go a little bit more deeper, as you mentioned, mm. but, uh, as you go through your career, you kind of learn, actually, there's some points I add that. They don't need to be there. They're very mm. basic. Mm. And you might add things based on experiences in other games where you think, oh, I wish I told the assistants that at the at the start and maybe I'll remember that for the next next time I do it. Right. Mm. So mm. I think that kind of comes back to your adaptability um, kind of um, mm. um, mindset earlier. Um, I'm talking about mindset. Yeah. <laughs> so 
mindset is a is a big one in, in in my book and probably a lot of other people's especially for example like you've had a bad day at work or you know like family friends like life does just get in the way like mm. have you got any like hints and tips like how to ensure like your match day isn't affected by these like have you got a process or mm -hmm. you know like what do you what do you do really I think I think that is a brilliant example, John, um, to say uh, often we're carrying in, you know, stuff from the workday. And um, the great thing is in in culture nowadays, people are starting to have these conversations. When I started refereeing, nobody talked about this. You know, mm -hmm. it was and, and it's still kind of it gets under my wick a little bit when people talk about removing the emotion from the game and all this. I'm like, no. Actually, what we understand now about emotion is that um, so there, there is a myth that we are rational creatures that sometimes experience emotion. Right. And actually, it's the opposite. We're emotional creatures that sometimes experience rational thought if we're lucky, <laughs> especially as men. So um, we we need to understand having that self-awareness of, again, what we're bringing into the game and what I need to be, what I need to feel successful to be in the game. So if you flick back to, to that um, slide again, so if you can see in the in that bottom, as I face it, my right hand corner. So that the idea of so this is our team logo that we've come up with. My um, my referee team, we I wear it as well, um, uh, and, and we can talk a little bit about culture coming up. But we have used a, utilized a, again. This is something that's de we've developed over time. This is not a like oh you know boom one click I'm done you know instant kind of thing. This we develop over time and because self awareness happens over time and we and we go through in layers and we understand you know who we are how we how we referee how we interact with people that develops and grows over time well or it should so. Um, I, I guess one thing, John, to, to kind of speak directly is that it's okay that there are going to be times when you get it, when you're like, yeah, that nailed that. And then sometimes you're like, nope, that definitely did not get, you know, that definitely muddy, muddied things, you know? I mean, I can remember um, in the National League, a couple of instances where, you know, we had a, I've got four beautiful children. They're now um, older, they're teenagers, but, you know, at times and it was it was challenging and we all face different challenges you know in home life as well um having to leave the house you know with my wife on a saturday morning going look i'm sorry babe i've, I've got to go and you've got three kids crying and one kid you know it's like and a wife that's like i'm gonna kill you um <laughs> so you know making sure to maintain those relationships is, is really important um and, and I guess I'll take the point, I will take this moment now also to, to, to credit, and I always try to give credit to my wife and my family, uh, and a little bit my extended family as well. I've actually, back in the States, I'm living with my parents again, so thank you, mom and dad. <laughs> but, um, you know, we do need to, part of the mindset is making sure that we value and acknowledge the relationships that are important to us in our life, because those are what sustain us, you know, over time. So, um to, to fast forward, we have uh, within our team three core emotions that we've worked through that we want to feel in order to be successful. So we focus on joy. We want to feel joy in what we do, uh, joy in the small things. But we also, um, and, and this is an interesting thing that, you know, hopefully one day we can talk more in detail, but we want other people to feel joy when they're watching us train or watching us referee, mm -hmm. um, feeling connected. Uh, both in terms of the team and also we want to feel connected to 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 the game um, having courage courage is about living in you know courage to live out our values but also courage to um to make the big decisions make the difficult decisions when we need to and of course then underpinning we we want that feeling of excellence excellence isn't really an emotion but it is uh definitely something that we want to see as part of part of what we're doing so um, it's more the outcome of the the other emotions, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there is that that it does it does speak to the sort of elation of knowing we've done a good job, that knowing we've kind of wrapped it all together, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there there is more meaning. I won't go into, but you know, the, the entire that logo, uh, which for us again is a mindset thing. So we can we refer back to it. One reason we wear it 
you know, on our kit underneath. So we, during the world, and I, we started this from 2018, not the same logo, but a different one because it's very team culture-y for us. Mm -hmm. um, or it's, a, it's, it's an important icon of our team culture um, that, you know, when stuff gets tough, we can come back to that. So we wear, you know, we've got, we all wear a compression short. Most people do, um, you know, so we can come back to that. It's, you know, as a way of grounding ourselves. So that mindset when it's difficult. So understanding the strategies, um, you know, breathing, understanding the importance of breath and breath work. Um, I've, I've started doing some meditation uh, specifically around attention um, that's been incre incredibly helpful. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll show you that. So the, 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 the emotional culture deck has become a really powerful tool for us. It's a, um, I won't go into all the spiel, but it's a, it's a deck, it's a game. It's a deck of cards. Um, if you've been around me long enough, you know, probably more than, you know, once or twice, I will probably have asked you to play because there it's talk. We, we talk about what do you need to feel in order to be successful? And so in that pre-match conversation, I'm sort of teasing some of that information out. Mm -hmm. I might go through it with the team, but I'm kind of teasing some of that so that I understand as the leader on the field that, and understand as well that the leader's mindset, okay, the, the referee's mindset can influence, emotions are contagious, right? So mm -hmm. um, understanding that what we bring into that, we can impact our team. So again, that's why I'm very particular about how I want to draw that out I'm listening for what is it that you need to feel in order to be successful? How do I need to communicate with you so that you feel another flash of lightning? Supported. <laughs> there you go. How we do for it. <laughs> yeah. So we yeah, can probably. Should we, should, I think okay. should we tie into some of the should we tie into some of the questions that uh that are coming through yeah uh, i just wanted to um or should, yeah no i just wanted to question what you just said around you being the leader and having to and your emotions are contagious but do you find just for the assistant referees who are who are watching do you find that your team are able to understand your emotions and and maybe you're maybe down in a game or you're you're angry or something and they know the trigger kind of words to communicate to you and how important yes. is that in teamwork yes absolutely we we talk about that so when you work with people regularly you can you can talk about that a little bit more um um deliberately you can build that over time but, but to say okay so the referee obviously the referee on the pitch does take the key leadership role, right? But in terms of leading, again, this is that whole thing of being excellent. I, I want my assistant referees, I want my fourth official to, to lead, to demonstrate that leadership when, it's a, when they need to. So they're bringing their leadership. We don't, we don't need a power, and, and leadership and power are two different things, right? So we've probably all been in a match where the power, even within a, team, a referee team, has been like this, right? It's like, well, who's gonna, you know, is it the referee that's, is it the assistant referee? The, re the assistant referee thinks, no, I should be the one in the middle uh, or the referee, you know, thinks, oh, you know, assist there's, there's referees and then there's assistant referees, you know? It's like, I, you know, I only wanna hear, I'll, I'll tell you when, you know, tell me when the ball's in and I'll play and I get everything else, you know? Yeah. Uh, the referees that are like, for me, every the penalty area is mine. Well, okay. Good luck, all the best, because there's going to be those times when you're going to need your assistant referee to pull you out of the jam. And if you've not created that uh, avenue for communication, you're going to get you're going to get stuck in it and you're going to have to live in it. So um, absolutely building that rapport with the assistant referees, under, helping them understand their level of experience, but also that even though they may be inexperienced, because now at the moment I'm, you know, it's just the nature of where things are. I'm, I'm working sometimes with people that don't have as much experience with, as me, but I want them to feel like they can, they, they are empowered again, that it's open. It's clear. They can communicate what they need to communicate, 
but I always do say that, look, I do reserve the right to say no, but that's mm -hmm. not, it's not personal. It's not because I don't like it. I just, you know, I've got to, I've got to lead at that time in that way as well. So. Perfect. Matthew, thanks so much for your insights for all this. We've got a few other topics that we wanted to talk about that based on the time, I want to get into some Q and A and sure, depending sure. on how that goes, we might bring some of these we'll questions back, yeah. back in, but yeah. um, thanks to all those people who are watching. Uh, if you haven't already uh, put a comment down either on Facebook or on YouTube on the comments and we'll ask a, a question of Matthew. We've got a few come in here. We've got a few that came in earlier that we'll share, but we'll start with uh, Ruben. Um, who wants to know how do you prepare when the game starts to heat up and a red card must be shown? Mm. Um, I, I was actually hoping to, there, I do have a, we had an interesting situation in, in Tokyo, um, uh, Cote d'Ivoire and Saudi right at the end of the game, all of a sudden it was, you know, and, and of course, you know, you're trying to, they liken it to landing a plane, right? You, you want to try and land that plane smoothly, right? At the end of the match. And all of a sudden, boom, it blows up. So again, to me, it comes back to understand that self-awareness, how, you know, what is the team, you know, what does it, what does the match need? Now I might raise my, we, I talk a lot about being calm. We might need to lift our presence but I want to make sure that I'm regulating my emotions so that I'm not getting angry, that things go wrong when I kind of get sucked into the emo the emotion of the moment that the players are kind of going at each other. So I try to remain calm. Um, and, you know, again, it's, it's following those processes of knowing, okay, now I'm a bigger person, so I can, I can move a little bit closer to players, but I also try to maintain space you know, understanding those strategies of, of body work and how you kind of keep moving that you don't get allow players behind you. If you can help it, knowing that the assistant referees have, have your back and, and, and knowing those processes. So we talk about mass confrontation, especially the lower level matches when maybe, um, again, I've not, maybe not worked together with the team so much that might be part of the pregame conversation, but really it's about, understanding okay how how do i want to react in this situation how do i want to respond actually more how do i want to respond in this situation to 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 help the players because the players need to regulate their emotion so um sometimes i'll try something like hey look um focus um look at my eyes if i can get them to look at me and not the player that they're arguing with then we can bring it bring it down having again building in some of those um, qualities that, you know, we, de we develop through training and we develop, you know, through experience over time. And, uh, just on that, I guess in a, in a moment where, you know, a red card is happening to avoid a mass confrontation, have you been a fan of getting the red card out quickly? Do you have to judge it based on, uh, you know, what's going on? Like is sometimes does it diffuse the situation? Sometimes does it explode the situation? What, what is it? Is it just on a case by case basis and using your experience to figure that out? Yes. Yeah. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it blows it up and sometimes it um, calms it down. So it's understanding how best to do that. Sometimes I need to hold it to get more, you know, to get, to gather more information. Right. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I need to get it out to say, Hey, no, 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 look, I've got it. I, I've got, he's going to be sent off. I've got it. And that, you know, if players are coming in from distance or, um, you know, if I can see it coming. So it's always maintaining that situational awareness, you know, and reading it's once we get into that kind of, so there's process and then there's that robotic procedure that once we get into the robotic procedure, I think that's when we end up in trouble. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also where, you know, as refereeing, I think that's where the game and, and players and sometimes, you know, and spectators can sometimes be critical of the robotic referee. Oh, they're just going through the motions again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, understanding that context may determine action, you know, but being really clear on first and foremost, being clear on what has happened and who are the players? Who do I need to who do I need to sanction or who do I need to watch out for 
or who's my peacemaker? Cause a player may be coming in from distance and, but they're actually the peacemaker. So learning to read all that's important. Awesome. Thank you. We're going to go try and rattle through some more of these questions. So this is a bit of a two-parter from James. He said, what's your proudest moment as a referee? And can you recall a moment where you had to show resilience in your career as a referee and how you overcame that setback? Absolutely. Great question. Uh, the proudest moment um, was probably, I guess I'll, I'll start with the first question. I'll start with the second question and then come back to it. Because the first question was one of the greatest setbacks was, um, was actually a, a poor decision in Rio in the second match, uh, Algeria versus Portugal. Um, it's probably some of the reason why they in wanted to introduce VAR because I gave <laughs> a, a ter I whistled a terrible penalty um, that was not a penalty. The player, uh, the goalkeeper plays the ball um, and then the, the, the Portuguese, it was the Algerian goalkeeper plays the ball and the Portuguese player goes over it. Um, I was in, a, again, I was in a kind of like a robotic mindset i was not really i was like procedure 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 i wasn't in process right so and we we hadn't i hadn't done the work you know in terms of my team and my team culture to really enable that open space for communication and i was too worried about the outcome and not worried about and not focused enough about the process and so um you know that set us back that that decision uh, we were, we'd probably been in line for uh, a, a knockout match at, at, at Rio, but that really set us back. We ended up going home early, uh, which was hugely disappointing. Um, as in, we went home at the cut. We didn't, um, we didn't stay through to the, to the knockout phase of the tournament. And it really made, but it, it also really made me question, you know, okay, What, are, what am I missing that was that was a catalyst for, you know, where I've gone and how I've developed, you know, this, this idea around vision, persistence, resilience, the idea of values and cultures, you know, so it's, it was really, it's really good in one sense, but it was, it was really difficult. Um, and there have been, there have been a few moments like that where one decision has probably cost me, you know, one, in fact, it did. One decision cost me promotion onto the A League. Um, you know, I didn't get on a, a year before I should have uh, for one decision. Mm. Um, so, you know, that's challenging. And so there are way more times of that having that build that resilience of asking myself, "Am I going to keep going?" The proudest moment then was probably on the. Uh, it was a significant feeling uh, walking off the pitch in our second match in Tokyo, um, South Africa, Mexico. And um, I mean, we, we, we had to have a VAR intervention for, for a red card, but we, but which was really difficult. We felt really good about that. We felt really good about the communication on that. And, and the, the way that we work together as a team I walked off that pitch going, I don't know. It carried a certain weight about it. It was like, okay, we're, we've, we're on the right path. We're, we're, we're moving forward. And even though, and that was even though it was a frustrating, some frustration in the tournament, we didn't get selected to referee another match. We stayed on, we did, you know, I was fourth official for a couple of games. You know, we always want to referee the next match, right? So um, there was certainly some frustration, some disappointment, um, there, but just a real feeling walking off that pitch in, um, uh, in the Sapporo dome that, you know, all that had kind of culminated and was working through. And it's kind of like a point. And now beyond that, now it's like everything can flourish. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks for that. Let me see. We've got quite a few questions coming in, so I'm going to try and, uh, speed them. Okay. So this one's a, a nice question about obviously your winter, um, how did it feel when when you saw your name was confirmed for the the World Cup in Qatar? Yeah, it it was uh, it was certainly a great feeling. Um, I actually I can't remember who someone texted me had seen it before. I'd been kind of looking out for it, but um, you know they had sort of texted me before I even saw the list. So it was a little bit up, up and then went and found, you know scrambled around finding, it. and of course then it was um, you know touching base with uh, with different 
you know, people that, of course, because the journey, you know, we've, this is the second World Cup. So we know, I know a lot of the guys and, and girls now that are uh, women uh, that are, you know, in the um, program. So making sure to, 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 to connect with those, especially that we have, you know, closer relationships with and, and, um, and, and for this one, we were in um, actually for both World Cups now. We've been, I've been in the U.S. when that's been um, uh, announced. So that was in 2018. It was, I was at the Dallas Cup, um, mm-hmm. uh, which was which was a which was a, a special moment there. And then um, this time it was with my parents in um, in Georgia, which was which was also nice. So of course, you know, I quickly, you know, called my wife back in New Zealand as well, and you know, confirmed. Yep, you know, we're it, it's official now. So that, that was always, um, yeah, very cool. But then it's like, right. Okay. Now the, now the real work begins. It's, it's weird, right? We, we often don't, uh, take time to celebrate the small things, but then you have to move straight on to, uh, to doing it. So, um, cool. So next one is from Jamie. And what advice would you have for young referees that are just coming through? Um, the, the the main thing is, and this is actually out of a conversation um, and, and also some research that, that I've recently, that I just read in a conversation that I had last night to say, you know, Jamie, there is a seat at the table for everybody in terms of refereeing. There are enough matches for everybody. And sometimes we need to be, and, and we need to, and, and part of what I hope to, to help leave as a legacy actually is a, a, a culture of development that enables young referees like yourself to, or Jamie, if you are young, if you're not, I'm sorry, I don't know, but um, uh, for young referees to feel like they can thrive in the environment, in the, at the level that they are, that we don't always have to strive for the next promotion. You know, we can, we can, if we can learn to be really excellent referees at the level that we're refereeing at then, and gain that enjoyment out of what we're doing, you know, find, find what it is in the process that you love, find what it is in the, in that persistence, those little things with excellence. What is it that you love doing? How is that fulfilling to you? Um, then, you know, that's, what's going to be um, the biggest thing to maintain over time. And, and, you know, uh, hopefully we can develop a greater network of mentoring, a greater network of relationships so that you feel like that young referees feel like they belong, that they, you know, and I guess to say everybody struggles, every referee I know struggles with the same things that young referees struggle with. Am I good enough? You know, is that the correct decision? You know, shoot, I've just made a mistake. I just uh, saw um, my good mate Collins, uh, Great to see you, Collins. Thanks for listening in. Um, you know, how do you overcome a feeling when you've made a mistake in a game? Often that happens from a young referee or two young referees. And it's realizing, hey, not every every mistake is not fatal, okay? Yes, one decision can impact whether I get the next round. But you know what? There will be another opportunity if you, if you keep going. If you – and talk to people about it. You don't have to carry that alone, okay? And it's okay – to, to, to work through. And it's okay to struggle because it's in the struggle that we learn and it's finding those places of support that move us through those challenging experiences. Awesome. A uh, few more. We've got actually getting starting to get quite a few in just near the end. So we'll, we'll try and wrap through. This one is a really interesting one. I think it's um, uh, around VAR. Um, yep. So how you, you mentioned you've had a few VAR. Sure. Uh, cool so like um i think the major one is how do you feel when you get a var uh, review but then uh i think it's a really good one to kind of educate people around do you feel obliged to change a decision yeah great question um so how do i feel going to the screen uh, again this is something that is developed over time and i've really tried to to, from the outset, try to learn how can I keep an open mindset going? In fact, there's been uh, one of the reasons why we have integrated training at tournaments is that, you know, we get called to the screen, you know, in training repeatedly sometimes, and you feel like rubbish, especially 
uh, uh, you know, recently, not recently, I can't remember the, the exact tournament, but you know, the first training pitch out there, you're like, right, we're going to make, you know, we're going to make our, our, our mark. And it's like, yep, BAR. And I'm like, okay, kind of confusing. Nope. I, I think I got called to the screen three times in this, um, in, in that training. But I mean, in the Club World Cup in 2018, we got called to the screen three times. My very first decision in the match, um, you know, which I'm, next time it, you know, I've learned from it. But, you know, very first decision of the match was a penalty decision inside the penalty area. I had to go to the screen. Cause it was a delayed, uh, a delayed pen. But um, so the main thing is, is trying to regulate, trying to breathe and realize that again, um, they have a view and they have evidence that they're seeing that is probably different from what I'm seeing. So it's realizing my limitations mm -hmm. and can I go with an open mind? Okay. So it becomes a little bit more of, okay, what am I seeing? Show me what I'm seeing. Okay. And does, I can't go, I have to go in with a, I can't, if I go into the fixed mindset, it often will, it, it can cause problems. But then sometimes you just know, Hey, yep. I, I'm not sure if it was a handball or not. Yep. Sure enough. Yep. Handball, boom, penalty, no problem. Um, do I, do I feel obliged to change the decision? Uh, not always. Um, it shouldn't, you shouldn't feel obliged. Again, you should, the, the teamwork and the development should be such that you know that the, that that person in the in the VOR is your teammate and they want the best outcome. And so if they're sending you the screen, it means there is information that that, you know, I've not gathered. There's a view that I've not been able to see. And so I need to be open to that. Um, uh, how that is communicated, you know, how again, there there is protocol within, you know, different leagues are I'm aware different leagues are implementing it slightly different. So you have to another one. <laughs> one storm. <laughs> we have to do working at the same good old good old Houston weather. There you hopefully, go. It, hopefully it doesn't impact the match tonight. <laughs> yeah. that, you'll be a bad omen because they'll be saying everywhere you go the storms two in a row that would be two in a row that would not be good <laughs> <laughs> all right matthew we're gonna we're gonna uh close it out there i think maybe might be able to pick one more let me see from the pre um uh, i think we actually had quite a few based on the fact this was a uh, uh a conversation about preparation Mm. Um, one of the questions that came up from quite a few people was the pre-match conversation with the assistants. And you've mentioned a few, a few kind of strategical things, but like, are there any like one, two, three things that you believe need to be included in that pre-match conversation? Um, communication. So I make sure to tell them that I'm, I want to open my mind to them. So especially if we're using a communications kit, that, um, you know, I'm leading that. So I'm going to, you know, I tell them, I'm going to give you attacker defender who plays the ball. I'm going to tell you more often than we need it sometimes so that when we do need it, it's there, right? Again, that process. Um, uh, for me, there's a couple of other little idiosyncrasies. I, I want my assistant referees, I talked to them about, I, I would rather tell you to be quiet than to try to tell you to speak more right and without and if even if and i tell uh referees that e even if we don't have a communication system as assistant referees i want you to to tell me talk you know red throw it's red 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 or, you know or that's a not necessarily a great choice to choose but you know um uh you know i need to um you know it's it's a corner it's a corner because because communication wise, there's something within the human brain that even if I can't hear you, I'm drawn to look at your face and look at your mouth. So I want to see that connection. So again, connection is really important. So please talk, even if we can't hear each other directly. And it also builds really good habits because then when you plug a comm system in, you're already used to doing it. Um, uh, the other thing is the interesting one that we talk about, the difference probably at grassroots and the elite 
uh, elite level is around the assistant referees who might write or not write recording information. Now, sometimes, uh, obviously, we need to make sure that you record the accurate information and little pitch for ref six, I suppose, <laughs> having that smartwatch to, to do so uh, is a good thing. But um, making sure that the, the priority is the field of play. OK, so if if the referee is writing, you know, the, the assistant referees are watching and then we make sure that we're working together. Don't rush that process. Um, so that was one. So eyes on field, making sure we maintain so we don't miss anything. And then um, uh, we have enough time to make the right decision. So let's use the time. We don't have to shotgun anything. OK, so and, and if we see something that is totally squirrely, that's totally it must be done. You know, stop is a universal language. Everybody around the world, everywhere I've known, if I say stop, they they at least pause and look at me. Stop works. And so if you've got information that we need, you know, tell me stop and don't let replay, uh, don't let play restart until we get it right. If you're going to tell me, if you wait till the changing room to tell me, better not tell, just just best to just keep it to yourself. <laughs> um, in fact, one, one person I said, you know, better just just help on the bus and just just keep going uh, <laughs> but um it was a bit of a yeah uh i can't remember the context of that but all to say you know let's make sure that you're, you're we're getting the critical information on the field of play so those three things look make sure that the communication is consistent it's it's all down to communication let's make sure we stay connected and make sure that we use that time to make the correct decision and don't let play restart. Even if we need to clarify, even if it looks messy, we can we can clean it up and we because it's better to be messy and get a, a correct outcome than it is to, you know, everything we just sweep it under the rug and oh I wondered about that, you know, back in the you know, oh shoot, I wasn't sure about that in the changing room. It's better not to to have that. Awesome. Matthew, thanks so much for all the tips, all the advice. I mean, I think we only scratched the surface. I think there's an opportunity to go even deeper into this topic and many others. Um, but thanks so much for giving us an insight into your world, um, not just now, but throughout your 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 journey as a referee, uh, going up the ranks um, and answering loads of questions. So thank you. Now I've just got a small plug, which is um, this has been a webinar brought to you by Ref6. If you don't know what Ref6 is, Go on to our YouTube channel and you'll see a ton of content about the app that we've designed for referees being used all over the world. Um, today, we are offering 20% um, off an annual subscription. So if you use the code CONGA20, um, uh, for the next two days, you'll be able to get 20% off an annual subscription. So uh, definitely download the app, try it out, uh, and, and I'm sure you'll love it. Um, but Matthew, once again, thank you so much for your time. I'm sure we'll do this again. Uh, for those who we didn't get uh, the questions answered, we'll, we'll save them up and we'll, we'll ask Matthew next time he's on. But uh, it just leaves us to say good luck in your game this evening. Hopefully the, this uh, hour has helped your preparation for the game. Hopefully the storm doesn't uh, impact you uh, too much. And um, we are definitely excited to see um see you in qatar and see how you and your team perform so thank you very much thank you so much hassan and john and dave in the background for uh keeping everything rolling on the the tech end um hassan thank you for uh the opportunity it is great to be able to speak with you and I, i've i've loved our chat and and yeah i think you know we could speak for probably hours about some of this stuff and, and as you said scratch the surface and i'd love to be able to to, to join you and your community. And, and one of the things that's on, I love about the work that you guys are doing at Ref6 is that you are part of, obviously you've got the app, but you're also wanting to build a community of refereeing, um, you know, that is, that is global. And, and I think it's something that we need to do more of. And it's something that I'm wholeheartedly want to, to support. So thank you very much to the, um, for the opportunity. Uh, thank you to all the folks that were, were listening, whether you're referees, your administrators, um, just fans of the game. Um, the more that we can promote refereeing, the more that we can support and um, highlight the, the the great work that um, men and women are doing 
on football fields, soccer fields, all over the world, from the grassroots level up to the elite level, you know, is is um, fantastic. So uh, the more that we do that, the more that we can enable the beautiful game. Uh, so thank you very much again, Hassan and John. It's great talking to you guys, and um, all the very best to you as well. Uh, and thanks to everyone who watched. Uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.